The necessary and proper clause operates a little differently than the other enumerated powers. Various clauses in the Constitution enumerate areas where Congress may legislate. The necessary and proper clause allows Congress to pass laws that might not be within the strictest reading of these other powers, but are sensibly related to them. To see how this works, we can adapt an example that Chief Justice Marshall offered as dicta in McCulloch v. Maryland. Congress has an enumerated power to establish post offices and post roads. This clearly authorizes Congress to pass a law to hire postal workers. We don't even need to think about the necessary and proper clause. Just as clearly, this clause does not authorize Congress to ban trans fats from all restaurants. Maybe some other enumerated power would support a law like that, but not the postal power. Those are easy cases, but as with any legal concept, there might be some harder cases around the edges. What about a statute making it a federal crime to steal the U.S. mail? Having that law is arguably not establishing a post office. However, it would make the U.S. Postal Service more secure and effective. The strict constructionists in John Marshall's time might have opposed a statute like this because they advocated for the narrowest possible reading of the enumerated powers. But the Necessary and Proper Clause is an explicit message from the framers that Congress is not limited to the stingiest possible reading of the government's powers. When we add the Necessary and Proper Clause into the mix, our question gets a lot easier. The clause allows Congress to pass laws to help carry into execution other powers. In essence, it authorizes laws in a zone that expands around other powers. Within that zone, there might be multiple laws that connect to each other but ultimately relate back to an enumerated power. For example, what will the federal government do with the people who are convicted of mail theft? It will incarcerate them in a federal prison. So we're making logical connections from one law to another, but always linking them back to some underlying power. This famous quote from McCulloch uses the notion of means and ends as a way of explaining the Constitution in general and the Necessary and Proper Clause in particular. Congress should have the ability to decide which laws to pass within some enumerated area of power. And it shouldn't have to worry about courts being unduly skeptical and making rulings that will limit the ability of Congress to pursue the public good. In this formula, Many of the enumerated powers set out goals or ends that Congress may pursue. When pursuing those goals, Congress has great latitude to choose the means that it wants to use. The first step in evaluating any law under the Necessary and Proper Clause is to identify a relevant power somewhere in the Constitution other than the Necessary and Proper Clause itself. That will be the ends. Now, the language of the clause calls for us to look in three places. There are the foregoing powers listed in Article 1, Section 8. There are other powers vested in Congress, and those might be found outside Article 1, Section 8. And then there are other powers that might be vested elsewhere in the federal government, including the judiciary and the executive branch. With the ends identified, our next question is to determine whether the law is necessary and proper to carry that power into execution. Centuries of case law indicate that the courts should be pretty deferential to Congress when making that judgment. So all that's needed is some rational relationship. The law doesn't have to have a perfect relationship to the underlying power, so long as it is not irrational or crazy. Here's a quote from a recent case indicating that only a rational relationship is needed. So now let's use this method to evaluate a few examples. The Defense Production Act of 1950 allows the federal government to order businesses to provide national defense material. For example, if your company makes weapons or ammunition or tires or medicine, the government could force you to enter into a contract to sell that product to the government, even if you would prefer not to, and then to prioritize fulfilling that contract over all your other customers. 
There's no power in the Constitution that unambiguously authorizes this statute in so many words. I mean, this is not an obvious case like using the Copyright Clause to enact the Copyright Act. So at this point, pause the video and consider a theory that might authorize this law using the Necessary and Proper Clause in conjunction with some other power. Several provisions in the Constitution authorize Congress to declare war and to operate military forces, and elsewhere it says the President will be their Commander-in-Chief. So we find these military powers of Congress in Article I, Section 8, so they are among the foregoing powers that are mentioned in the Necessary and Proper Clause. So now let's move to the second step. Does the proposed law have a reasonable relationship to that enumerated power? The answer here is yes. To be effective, a military requires supplies, and this law allows the government to procure those supplies. So this is a permissible use of the necessary and proper power. Ships and boats are usually expensive, and people take out loans to afford them, and those loans often come with mortgages. Now, historically, state courts are the usual location for resolving questions about mortgages. However, this Federal Ship Mortgage Act of 1920 authorizes the federal courts to hear those kinds of disputes. Pause the video and consider a theory that might authorize this law, using the Necessary and Proper Clause in conjunction with some other power. There does not seem to be anything in the foregoing powers of Article I, Section 8 that is closely on point. But remember, the Necessary and Proper Clause allows Congress to make laws to help carry into execution powers that the Constitution vests elsewhere in the government of the United States, and that includes the judiciary. So the federal courts have enumerated subject matter jurisdiction over admiralty and maritime cases. So we have identified a constitutionally legitimate end. We then must decide if there's a reasonable relationship between the Ship Mortgage Act and admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. As it happens, the Supreme Court held that this law was reasonably related to admiralty and maritime law. By allowing this class of ownership disputes to be resolved in federal courts, the statute was helping carry into execution the federal power to adjudicate disputes involving seagoing vessels. In light of this reasonable relationship, the law was an acceptable use of the Necessary and Proper Clause.